the son, the daughter, and the sword. Even though he's the main villain from one of my favorite video games of all time, even I sometimes overlook or forget about Jack of Blades and the awesome presence that he has in Fable. Welcome back everyone to the Villainpedia again. This entry is going to be a fun one as I think there's a ton of background to Jack that a lot of people don't know that adds a lot of mystery to the character and just to the world of Albion in general. So get comfy, put this video on in the background while you're working on something, and as usual, if you like the video, remember to like it down below and subscribe for more, and obviously, there are spoilers ahead. Well, as you most likely know, Jack of Blades is the main antagonist from the first Fable game released in 2004. Fable is a pretty light-hearted RPG with this sort of cartoony art style and humor literally everywhere, but Jack of Blades acts as a great stopper to the fun pretty much across the board. I mean, he's never really the butt end of a joke or made light of. So in contrast to the rest of the experience, he's rather menacing, which I think works really, really well. As a kid, I always kind of thought he was just some, you know, bandit sort of leader kind of guy trying to sow chaos in Albion or just something simple, but his true origins are more interesting and might surprise you. So much of his backstory was not directly given to us in game, but rather via a now defunct website known as Tales of Albion. Near the beginning of the long history of Albion, the world was a quiet and peaceful place. But peace wouldn't last long, as three visitors would change the land forever. They came from the Void, the darkness that exists outside of Albion and kind of outside of reality. The Void is even possibly a different dimension altogether, who knows. The three were the Queen of Blades, the Knight of Blades, and of course, the Jack of Blades. So you see this classic deck of cards theme starting out, which, I mean, who doesn't love that, man? It's so cool. The three were collectively known as the Court, and they were not very nice, let me tell you. They came to Albion with the simple task of making it their own, and made their demands very simple to the people. Let us rule you, or else. The people, in their resilience, resisted the court and said, hey, get the hell out of here, but they unfortunately would pay the price. The court used their out-of-this-world power to burn the land of Albion constantly, until the sky was choked with smoke and the very earth was turned black. Even still, though, the people refused their wannabe overlords and flipped them the bird. Now that's sticking to your principles. We're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week. Yes. But all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting. Yes, I see. But sadly, yeah, Albion would pay again, as this time the court lifted the sea into the sky and flooded all of the world, devastating humanity once again. But you guessed it, the people still would not budge. They still refused the court. So for their third trick, the court promised peace. But nobody trusted that offer, so the court infiltrated their minds causing them to turn on one another and go mad, literally like brother killing brother. This is what finally broke the will of the populace and they agreed to serve and worship the court. Now an important character comes into our story, an ordinary man by the name of William Black, the son of a blacksmith who ended up being the key to saving Albion from Jack and the court's reign. As William grew into a man, he displayed some crazy magical abilities in his little town that dazzled all of his fellow peasants. All of these tricks were performed with the power of his mind alone, and these feats were eventually nicknamed Acts of Will, like William, which would end up sticking throughout history as the word to describe the magical arts. William was obsessed with his overlords of the court and became hell-bent on finding a way to free Albion from their evil. One evening, he was doing some light reading of an old mystical book and got snatched out of Albion and transported into the void. All of a sudden, he was face to face with Jack of Blades in the Netherworld. Jack attempted to trap William there with the power of a mythical sword, we'll come back to that. But William used his will powers and managed to steal the sword from Jack and was teleported back to Albion. That little old sword happened to be the Sword of Aeons, and it spoke to William. It offered to help in defeating the court, but at the cost of William's soul. He said, you got a deal, Mr. Sword, and William was off to scale the biggest mountain in Albion to challenge the Three Blades. The first he would face is the Knight of Blades, and William whooped his ass with zero issue, the Sword of Aeons guiding his hand. The next was actually our boy, Jack of Blades. The two went blow for blow for some time until William was able to destroy Jack's body with a mighty blow. Though, you guessed it, Jack did not fully perish, as his spirit was able to escape back into the void. It's unknown for sure how this happened, but many people, myself included, believe that he was able to trap his spirit in his mask for which he is so famous for. 
Last up was the Queen of Blades, who William fought for apparently weeks and weeks on end. A battle of epic proportions that quite literally shaped the world around them. But eventually, Willie killed her too, united Albion, became the first Archon, and the rest of his story is for another day. So, extremely interesting, right? That the Queen was seemingly much more powerful than Jack. Good thing she didn't know that old mask trick or we would have been in real trouble. So, Jack of Blades had slipped away, probably into his mask, and was the only surviving member of the court to just kind of stew in the void and plan his next move. It's widely accepted that the other two masks that Jack sports on his outfit are either the actual masks of the knight and the queen, or just meant to represent their memory. William Black, meanwhile, left a legacy and a bloodline behind. A bloodline of potential heroes, meaning potential issues for Jack should he be able to stage some sort of a comeback, as it would take someone of that bloodline to again wield the Sword of Aeons. This, of course, leads Jack of Blades to you, the player and descendant of heroes, when he is just a boy in the opening hour of the game. So the stage is set wonderfully for a coming-of-age hero to assume the responsibility of his blood and destiny and face down with Jack of Blades. So let's just talk about Jack for a moment. I mean, what makes him so powerful? How is he still even walking around all this time later if his body was destroyed? I think all of the answers are in the mask. The mask seems to hold all of Jack's power, along with holding Jack himself, really, and allows him to live on in other bodies, even though his original form is gone. Another name for his mask is the Soul Mask, because it's believed that Jack has used it to lure the souls of heroes throughout the ages, and then use their bodies to appear immortal, his legend growing through generations. So he's really a true puppet master. This mask, combined with literally thousands of years though, possibly even more, let's be honest, of violence and domination and experience, have made Jack into just an absolute killing machine and a master of strength, will, and skill, the three categories of ass-whooping potential in the Fable games. Jack's goal seems relatively simple, which is fitting, I think, for Fable. He wants to find and kill you, and use your blood to unlock the Blade of Aeons once more for himself, and perhaps take your body as well, who knows. And he employs some pretty ruthless tactics to achieve this goal. But before we get fully to that, I have to mention something somewhat unique about Jack. He actually doesn't show up in-game for a pretty damn long time. I mean, no real mention of him, even though we can kind of see that he's the one killing the hero's dad in a little intro. No name is dropped, and it's never really made fully clear that he is the bad guy you need to go get until much later on. I think this is honestly brilliant. Fable is like the game that comes to mind for many when you think about player choice and being able to play as a hero or a villain. I think if you showed this ancient evil guy right away and said, you know, go get him, it would just inform the player a little too much to be a straight up good guy. This is the player's journey and you will decide the path for yourself. There's no prophecy of good conquering evil here, which gives a freedom to the player that's much, much appreciated. So early on in the game, as a little kid, the innocence of the world is shattered when bandits attack your hometown of Oakvale, killing half the town including your old papa, and capturing your sister and mother in the process. You're left alone to be discovered by Maze, a hero from the guild who recruits you for hero training. This of course is all Jack of Blades doing, and even Maze, who seems like a trusted guide and definitely on the good guy side, is secretly an agent working for Jack, attempting to lead you to your doom. What a bastard. You grow into a young man and set out on your journey to become a hero or villain as you see fit, and good old Jack of Blades is out there monitoring you. So when you finally do encounter Jack, it comes much later on in the arena, a very iconic location in Fable where you go to prove your worth as a hero and earn some cash. You're joined in battle there by your old friend from the guild, Whisper, another aspiring hero. When you complete the eight battles together, Jack of Blades appears and is introduced as a hero of heroes. I have returned. After an eternity away from you all, Jack of Blades is back. Hmm. Very interesting. I think this is perhaps because he has deceived people into trusting him, or because he's literally using the body of a recognizable hero, but either way, he is in the seat of power and announces that he's back in Albion and wants the two arena champions to now fight each other for a final showdown. This is awesome. I mean, it allows Jack to directly give the player a huge moral decision to make depending on if the player's been taking the path of darkness or the path of light. Basically, you kill Whisper, you get $10,000, or you let her live and pat yourself on the back. He's done it! We have a new arena champion! After the fight, you notice that there's a statue of a great hero in the arena who looks strangely like your mom. 
and Jack appears and sweet talks you, revealing that that is your mom. She was once a legendary hero who gave it all up to start a family. But her dedication came with a price. After her final battle, she was never the same. She lives now in complete solitude, crushed by her failure to save her family long ago. And yet here you are. So odd how this guy who's been hunting you down for so long just casually talks to you and lets you go. He's very confident and obviously very manipulative. Sometime later, you're also reunited with your sister Teresa, and she reveals that Jack plucked out her eyes as a child when she was captured, and locked up your mother in Bargate Prison, so she's surprisingly still alive. You go try to bust her out, and you are able to find her, but Jack stops the plan in its tracks and locks you up for an entire year. Now this is where the destiny of the hero is finally made clear, pretty far into the game, that Jack has been responsible for everything being ruined in his life, and it's time to go kill this fool. So Jack of Blades has his plan in full swing, and it's honestly working frighteningly well. The only hope for us is to track down something called Focus Sights, revealed to us by the dying maze when we finally confront him for his treachery. You want to know why I did it, don't you? I suppose I'm just an old coward boy. We don't all embrace death easily. When Jack is able to activate all of these sights, He's going to unlock the Blade of Aeons, and that ain't good for us. But ultimately, the hero fails, which is also a nice surprise for me. We don't get to those sites before Jack. I just love when things don't work out the way you think traditionally they would. Jack captures the hero's mother and sister yet again and takes them to the chamber in the guild where the sword awaits. When you get there, Jack savagely kills your mama right there and awakens the sword, and oh baby, the final fight is on. When you defeat Jack at last, you are faced with really the decision of Fable. And now comes the choice I spoke of so long ago. Strike me down now with the Sword of Aeons, and you will become as powerful as Jack dreamt of being. Cast it into the Vortex, and its darkness will be gone forever. Just an awesome conclusion to Jack's reign. Or is it? Because Jack of Blades is not done here, not yet. In the DLC for Fable known as the Lost Chapters, a demon door that has long sat dormant has awakened, and by presenting Jack of Blades' legendary mask, you are allowed to enter. Through another quest line, you can eventually face Jack one last time, but now he takes on the form of a dragon. Is this his true form? I don't personally think so. I think the dragon represents the rage of Jack of Blades at his defeat, and maybe his final attempt to break the hero of Oakvale. When Jack the dragon is finally killed, you seal his soul again in his ancient mask, and you are faced with a Lord of the Rings moment. The battle is not over yet. You must destroy the mask. Whatever you do, you must not wear it. Wear me. Wear me. The gods lend me no power. Can you hear me? It is vital you cast the mask away. Wear me. And the world will bow at your feet. Listen to me. Destroy the mask now. No. I told you I could not be killed so easily, hero. <laughs> we always in these videos have to talk about why a villain fails. And I think for Jack of Blades, it's the thing that he swore he would overcome, the bloodline of William Black. Regardless if the descendant decides he wants to be a villain like Jack or a hero like William, I think Jack of Blades never really stood a chance. The way that Jack came and crashed the party in Oakvale early on was probably the worst move ever. He set the hero of Oakvale out on a classic revenge arc. Hadn't this fool ever read some storybooks or seen Star Wars, man? Come on, Jack. I know that Jack of Blades is not necessarily the sort of villain that comes to mind when you think of the very best. He's not very complex, it doesn't draw any sympathy, and he rarely surprises us, but he is the absolute perfect fit in Fable. He's both a steady hand in his evil deeds to contrast with the lighthearted nature of the game, as well as a great vehicle for the aspect of player choice and good and evil. If you're doing an evil playthrough, you can easily justify your pursuit of him by wanting to replace him 
gain his power and even literally become him to further your own agenda, while a good character has the obvious motivations for avenging his family and saving Albion. Jack's legacy as a villain is one of consistency and just good old fashioned evil. It's also hard not to like his appearance with the mask and the red and black. He just has a great look that I think Fable fans have always really liked. Of the three Fable games, Jack is absolutely the most memorable villain and I really hope that someday we are able to see him again. Thank you everyone so much for watching this video. I actually have a growing list of suggestions for the Villainpedia, but hey, I'm always looking for more. So drop them down below, remember to like, subscribe, all that jazz. And until next time, peace.